there's just, uh, there's just, I mean, in this case, obviously, one big mess here, and so many unanswered questions. So, let's go to Web Sleuths for some posts here from 2019. According to people claiming to be involved in the pedophile ring, Johnny was kept alive because he was so much in the media limelight. He was the golden boy or the media boy, then he ran away and escaped. Neither Eugene Martin nor Mark James Allen had the same publicity as Johnny, so if Johnny is alive, and if the others were abducted into the same organization and are dead, then one could justify it that way. I mean, that's an interesting point that nobody thinks about. So all these sickos, would they want to pay more for this missing boy who had all this national attention? So would this pedophile ring make a lot more money by keeping him alive? The only reason I can think of that would keep a grown man from resurfacing and reconnecting with his family are one, the family had something to do with the abduction, John Leonard Gosh question mark, or two, the now grown man had done some pretty bad things that are against the law and stepping forward might cause him to have to answer to those bad things. What else could keep a 40-something man from stepping forward and saying, hey, I'm John Gosh and this is what happened when I was 12? Some responses here, never underestimate the power of fear. And that's a good point as well. Some re posts here regarding uh, Gannon. I suppose technically, barring a DNA test, Gannon is up in the air. But I really don't think he is Johnny. Isn't there proof that Gannon was alive and well, last name Guckert, before Johnny was even abducted, school record and whatnot? And again, if there were a few photos produced or like one article, I mean, if this is a vast government conspiracy, you know, that's the weird thing about coincidence theorists. I mean, if there is a, cons a vast, far-reaching government conspiracy involving, like, possibly billions of dollars, or if not, at least millions, how would they not be able to produce a couple of fake records? But coincidence theorists, they see those records and say, oh, well, that's that! That settles that! Because records can't be faked! It's just really weird, the Dunning-Kruger stylings of coincidence theorists. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I'm just saying if there is a vast conspiracy and there was an attempt to cover it up, I mean, it clearly wouldn't be that diff di difficult to fabricate some records and possibly pay off a couple people at schools or whatever. Another post here, we also have to remember that Johnny would be a very damaged human being and may not be ready to face the outside world. And again, or if this MK Ultra is so advanced, again, even if he's not Ganon, if he's somebody else, if he doesn't even know he's Johnny Gosh, he would never be able to come forward. Another response here, I don't think Ganon is Johnny Gosh either, but his background is very strange. I cannot let this one go as being possible. I am normally really dismissive of conspiracy theories. Everything about the idea Gannon is gosh seems ridiculous on the surface. But I don't think Gannon has ever produced anything to indicate evidence of a life before he was Guckert. I believe he indicated at one point that he would introduce parents or family members to the media, but that never happened. He also said he would take a DNA test, and never did. Look, if he is Johnny Gosh and had his reasons for not wanting to come forward, I don't think anyone should pressure him to. But this theory that seems so crazy, yet given the details of the case as plausible, is out there. And I can conceive of reasons he might not want to take a DNA test or bring family members into this, but no one in the media ever found a family member. And if you wanted to test someone's DNA, it's not illegal to use their trash or any discarded refuse of theirs to do so. I can't believe Noreen Gosh wouldn't have tried this already. Uh, unless she did. Unless she has nothing with Johnny's DNA on it to compare it to, in which, I mean, I'm sure they have his DNA. I can't believe Noreen wouldn't have tried this already. Okay, in which case, they, why haven't they given it to the police, given it a try? DNA obtained in the April Tinsley case was obtained without a warrant, simply by intercepting the two remaining suspects' trash. I know it's a crazy theory, but everything about this case is crazy. Part of me wants to know what happened to Johnny Gosh, really wants someone to do a DNA test. That part of me doesn't want to see someone thrust into the spotlight unwillingly if they are Gosh. Knows it should be left alone. For me, it will always be something that hangs over this case, and I think it's possibly true. Yeah, I mean, th this is crazy. So let's continue down this rabbit hole, and we will be touching upon Hunter S. Thompson. This is a post from imaginativeworlds.com, Enter the Realm of Unknown Forums, and uh, I don't believe this is 
up anymore, but back in 2005, an interesting post here, March 28, 2005, by Gormworm. Friday, 2000, uh, February 25th, 2005, Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian Grove Snuff Porn. I've been watching this story percolate since this weekend, and with Thursday's return of Jeff Gannon to the blogosphere with a column entitled Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, really brings it all full circle. Several questions are begged here. As the Jeff Gannon story progressed and turned into a Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal, internet investigators started asking if there could be a connection to the previous Bush White House homosexual prostitution scandal. If you recall, the stories of 15-year-old callboys wandering through the White House in the middle of the night was linked to the Franklin cover-up case exposed by Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp. In that case, a Republican operative named Larry King was involved with procuring boys and girls from Boys Town in Nebraska and elsewhere and entrapping them in a child sex slave and espionage ring. King, with an annual salary of under $20,000, was throwing sex parties for the powerful in a $5,000 a month condo in Washington, D.C., apparently taping the proceedings for blackmail purposes. And again, in 2005, to coincidence theorists and authority-worshipping cultists, they probably were like, oh, this is complete nonsense, but in the post-Epstein area, a lot of these coincidence theorist goofs, I mean, even they, are they still pretending and hallucinating that there's no no corruption of this kind. I mean, it's just weird. One of the victims of this ring was one Paul Bonacci, who testified in court proceedings that he helped kidnap Johnny Gosh in the, into the ring in 1982. It was apparently 2.29 a.m. Sunday, February 20th, when the question was first asked, is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? By the end of the day, Hunter S. Thompson was reported dead. Must have been another coincidence, though. I mean, how could it not be a coincidence, right? So let's go to total411.info. I don't think this is up anymore either, but February 2005. Total information analysis. Friday, February 25th, 2005. Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, Hunter Thompson, and Bohemian uh, Grove of Snuff Porn. And this is where it gets really interesting. Bonacci also testified that he was forced in July 1984 to participate in a homosexual, pedophilic, necrophilic orgy at what has since been identified as Bohemian Grove, all of which was filmed. And according to Bonacci, the man in charge of the filming was someone picked up in Las Vegas on the plane headed to the Grove, a man who Bonacci was told was one Hunter Thompson. No doubt most people who came across this information in the past were familiar with Thompson's work, dismissed the idea that the man behind the camera could have been the famous writer. After all, this was a man who had been fighting the likes of Nixon and Bush his entire career. But could Thompson have been brought to the Grove by someone who presented it as an opportunity to investigate what the power elite was up to behind closed doors? Could Thompson have quickly found himself in over his head, compromised by virtue of his very presence at this horrific crime, by the men he thought he was investigating undercover? Wow, what a theory that is. Or perhaps compromised some other way. Perhaps, for instance, he was surreptitiously filmed with an adult female prostitute who was then murdered, but I digress. But back for now to the who is Jeff Gannon question. James D. Guckert seems to have appeared out of nowhere around 1999 setting up male escort websites. In profiles on these sites from around 2001, Jeff said he was 31 years old, closer to Johnny Gosh's age than James Guckert's. Huh. Guckert Gannon claims to be 47 today in 2005, at the time of this article. So he changed his age. Okay, well, that's weird. Jeff Gannon, a.k.a. James Guckert, also was attending alumni events at the TKE fraternity of Westchester College in Pennsylvania. Local media called the college and confirmed that a James Guckert graduated from Westchester in 1980, 
but apparently no one has checked yearbooks and such to confirm if the same man seems to be depicted. Okay, and Guckert, I would argue Guckert is a more popular name than Gannon, because because I've known a couple Guckerts uh, in passing, and I've seen that name quite more often than than uh, than Gannon. Could James Guckert be just another false identity? Another Democratic underground investigator found 1986 and 1987 pictures of a uh, Jeff Guckert. Not a James Guckert, but a Jeff Guckert from Fairview High School in that same Pennsylvania-Delaware border area that James D. Guckert, a.k.a. Jeff Gannon, claimed residence on his escort and porn website and was cited for $20,000 in back taxes. Jeff Guckert would have been about the same age as Johnny Gosh when he was playing high school golf. Huh. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Did Gosh go on to assume the identity of James Guckert, a man 10 years older than himself, sometime in the 90s? Huh. Consider this. From his mother, Noreen Gosh, uh, Johnny Gosh Foundation website in 2001. Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality, brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. In February 1999, a federal court testimony in Omaha, Nebraska, Noreen Gosh testified that Johnny Gosh came to see her in 1997, providing information about his experience, asking for his mother's help, and pleading for her to not reveal his visit. Johnny is now 31 years old. After years of suffering tremendous torture and pain at the hands of his captors being used and abused, he and several others have escaped. They have been hiding. They have been living and hiding under new identities. They fear for their lives. People ask, why is it necessary for someone to hide and live this way? It is simple. Johnny can identify many of the people involved and would be a threat to the very people who took him. He is known as the chameleon. Why? Because he can so completely change his appearance. Chameleon, again, on Democratic Underground, someone points to a purple blemish on Jeff's chest in one of his circa 2002 escort photos asking if that is a mark left by birthmark removal. According to his mother, Johnny the Chameleon Gosh still had the birthmark in 1997. So he just happens to have a blemish in the exact same spot where Johnny Gosh has a birthmark. Does anybody find that strange? Well, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. In one of his first interviews... On CNN's Anderson Cooper 360, Jeff Gannon said James Guckert is the name on my driver's license. His handlers have apparently warned him on that point, and he now claims it is given name. So what is the deal here? Is Jeff Gannon really Johnny Gosh? Noreen Gosh refuses to confirm or deny. If Gannon is Gosh, what is going on with him? Is his strange behavior a result of years of brainwashing, or is it something more? Is it possible he drew attention to himself during that January 26th press conference to pique the curiosity of citizen investigators, to draw attention to the dark side of the past 24 years of the Bush regime? He invited this investigation after the press conference and before the escort revelations by publishing a column titled, Hiding in Plain Sight. What? And this was within days of the Franklin cover-up figure George Paul Bishop's sudden arrest. So he wrote, so the first major article he wrote was hiding in plain sight. What? Okay. And did that investigation have anything to do with the death of Hunter Thompson? Sherman Skolnick and Tom Hennigan at Cloak and Dagger Internet Radio say... Thompson was working on a book about high-level sex rings, though they haven't offered a source. 
But that claim aside, we still have the timing of Thompson's reported death coinciding with these investigations. Did Thompson kill himself out of shame for his part at what happened at the Grove? Was he murdered to shut him up? Or did he fake his death to go underground while all this was breaking? Is there anything to all these questions? Jeff Gannon hints at a yes by putting up a new website headlined by a piece titled After Thompson's Most Famous Works. It's all in plain sight. I'll bet through the looking glass. Huh. Comments here are that uh, the birthmark, that blemish that is could be birthmark removal, it could also just be... Uh, it could also be some kind of makeup. All right, let's let's go down this rabbit hole. I mean, this is some dark stuff. This is really, really dark. We're gonna go to unicorn144.wordpress.com, and this is November thirtieth, twenty sixteen. The Paperboy Johnny Gosh and the Hunter S. Thompson snuff film at Bohemian Grove. In 2010, the Huffington Post released an article on a problem that gets little attention in the mainstream press. And what's curious is that it has since, uh, I don't know if it's still available, it's not coming up, but I mean, I'm going to read a transcription of the article, but I don't, I don't know if it's still online here. One that if you do your research into it, you will uncover a monster so vile it will make you shudder. Some cry, some fill with rage, many just turn away as if the truth of the matter is so harsh that they just can't compute it when they see what's really going on with the highest levels of government and elite circles in America. So this is Huffington Post, July 23rd, 2010. A major federal investigation has found that dozens of military officials and defense contractors, including some with top-level security clearances, allegedly bought and downloaded child pornography on private or government computers. The Pentagon on Friday released investigative reports spanning almost a decade that implicated individuals working with agencies handling some of the nation's most closely guarded secrets, including the National Security Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office, which operates U.S. spy satellites. Defense workers who purchased child porn put the Department of Defense, the military, and national security at risk by compromising computer systems, military installations, and security clearances, a 2007 investigative report said. The suspects also put the Defense Department at risk of blackmail, bribery, and threats, one report added. The, report, the reports, however, do not point to any specific security breaches. Huh. So back to the blog here, this story, high-level government workers with millions of child porn files on their work computers came to the list, came to light originally through the Boston Globe in 2010, who had obtained documents through the Freedom of Information Act from the U.S. government, though most of the documents were blacked out, including, of course, most names. Some arrests were made at the time, and a few five-year prison terms were handed out. Some of them accused quickly paid fines, most were never named, and got away with it, although the Pentagon swore to investigate the disgusting epidemic further to get to the bottom of it. Skip ahead a couple years to 2012, and we find the Pentagon did nothing of the sort. There were no further findings reported. In fact, there was no action whatsoever, and according to Forbes that year, September 19, 2012, the Pentagon is under fire for failing to examine 1,700 out of the 5,200 reports of employees doing child porn. The Pentagon claimed it wasn't a priority. Senator Grassley and his staff have made it one. The closed investigation into widespread use of child porn at the Pentagon is now reopened. And this, this article is still up on Forbes.com. Uh, September 19, 2012, to catch government workers with ties to child porn, call the IRS. That's from that article. 5,200 reports. This could be the most disturbing thing ever reported. Can you picture any other organization having 5,200 known pedophiles all working on the same place? I mean, it's kind of unclear how many of the reports are from the same person, though. But this is no coincidence, that's for sure. These men and women who are government officials, national security agents, Pentagon workers, elected representatives, intelligence agents, etc., to be doing this at work or on government networks in general altogether shows that it is a company-wide epidemic which must stem from inside the company, the U.S. government.
To this day, this case remains an unknown work in progress. Since this story has been forgotten by the mainstream media as of late, or at least suppressed, it basically doesn't exist anymore. But this sickening tale doesn't start in 2010 with the Boston Globe article. Way back in the late 1980s, there was a scandal blown open known as the Franklin cover-up in which a banker named Lawrence King, who ended up going to jail on a $40 million fraud charge for stealing, cre uh, for stealing from the credit union he rang, also was identified for running a child prostitution ring out of Nebraska where hundreds of children, some younger than 10, were flown around the country on chartered jets to have sex and much worse activity with extremely wealthy and powerful American men. High-ranking government officials, including those in the White House at the time, were fingered for not only pedophilia, but making videos of their actions, beating the young men they raped, owning child prostitutes of their own, trading the kids between themselves, and even murdering them. Though there were 80 kids who came forward who were used as sex slaves for King, all telling the same story, after death threats and a few murders, 78 of the kids rescinded their stories. I mean, that's still a lot. 80 kids to come out of the woodwork if they were lying. I mean, that's a lot. The two that didn't were put in jail for perjury. No investigation has ever been launched into the matter since. The first film we're showing, though, it was bought out and canceled 20 minutes before it was set to air on TV, was made at the height of the scandal. It's enough to make your jaw drop to the floor. It will also shed light on why this is the Franklin cover-up and not the biggest case in American history. And if it wasn't covered up, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is just crazy. I mean, people, l look at the outrage over, again, I mean, perhaps uh, Donald Trump's tweets or whatever. The country went crazy. A lot of people went crazy over comments he made or, or whatever jokes he made. I mean, when there's this going on, I mean, just imagine the disproportional outrage here. Um, the harming of children versus, you know, tweet, you know, some jokes from a politician. I mean, it's just crazy. And they're referring, of course, to the Conspiracy of Silence documentary. Long before Alex Jones snuck a camera in to film the cremation of care ceremony, one of King's child victims in the above film, Paul Bonacci, testified that he made midnight visits to the White House in the 1980s and witnessed top politicians receive sexual acts from male children. Bonacci has also been documented many times recounting a bone-chilling story of himself and another boy being forced into making a snuff film, a film where someone is actually murdered in front of the camera, where a third child was raped, tortured, and killed in the notorious, now not-so-secret, elitist club in the Redwoods of Northern California, called the Bohemian Grove. At the time of his emotional description, which is below, Bonacci, who was in prison for child abuse and perjury charges for not retracting his story like the other 78 victims, had no idea what the Bohemian Grove was. No one did until the internet came around, but he described exactly as it looks, where it was, where the snuff filming took place, and even states the men in hoods took care of the dead boy's body. It's uncanny. And uh, Bonacci's interviews are available on YouTube in various videos. I'm actually not going to listen to them because that's, uh, that's a bit too disturbing uh, for people that actually want to hear the words from his mouth. Again, just our background into Bonacci, everything he said regarding Gosh and a lot of these people was all verified by PIs, etc. Former Republican member of the Nebraska Liter Le Legislature, Senator John DeCamp, investigated the Franklin cover-up for decades, and in his book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska, he writes, quote, In other testimony, Paul Bonacci said that Larry King, not the CNN Larry King, Lawrence King of Franklin Credit Union, was smiling and laughing the whole time the film was being shown, and that the men in with hoods were a satanic group which planned to use the dead boy in some sort of ceremony. Bonacci also named the director of the snuff film who they had picked up in Las Vegas as Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson, so that's the end of the quote there. Hunter Thompson, question mark. Hunter S. Thompson of fear and loathing in Las Vegas fame. Yes, 
That's the allegation, and though, of course, it is only an accusation, here are some pretty damning supporting facts. A man named Russell Bridges, who is a, Rep a Republican Party photographer and also a photograph, a photographer for Lawrence King, claims Hunter S. Thompson offered him $100,000 to shoot a snuff film for him in the 80s, which he declined. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary wrote on his memoir blog that he once tried to make her watch a snuff film, which she refused to watch. Hunter S. Thompson's secretary, Nicole Brown, in in her memoirs, stated Hunter S. Thompson tried to get her to watch a snuff film connected to the Franklin cover-up. According to Wikipedia, Hunter S. Thompson lived in San Francisco, California, the same place as Bohemian Grove at the time this all allegedly took place, and he was researching twisted pornography at that time too, example, bestiality, and other disgusting mediums. This brings us to another link in this gruesome chain, Johnny Gosh. On September 5th, 1983, at 12 years old, while out in his paper route in West Des Moines, Johnny was kidnapped. His mother, Noreen Gosh, has been relentlessly searching for Johnny ever since and has come to some terrifying conclusions. The first, her son seems to have been targeted, photographed, and sold the night before his abductors grabbed him. Below, telling the rest is an excerpt by Noreen from johnnygosh.com. In 1989, Paul Bonacci provided his attorney, John DeCamp, with information indicating he had participated in the abduction of a Des Moines, Iowa paperboy. This paperboy was Johnny Gosh. Bonacci's testimony provided a great deal of info about Johnny in his case. However, local authorities refused to interview him, questioning his credibility. According to numerous reports, Johnny was taken by a highly organized, very corporate, global pedophile pornography ring. Evidence links to this... 80s congressional callboy scandal, money laundering, drug running, illegal arms deals, and more. Like so many others before and since, Johnny was subjected to severe trauma and torture of a satanic and sexual nature in order to intentionally destroy the conscious personality, brainwashing. This intentional application of trauma is a systematic procedure used to control these victims in order to use them in sexual slavery, pornography, and more. End quote. As mentioned in one of the movie clips below, an FBI agent in the 80s who was assigned to the case named Gary Caradori, once contacted Noreen saying he was flying out to Chicago to meet a source that would prove Johnny was a victim of the child sex slave ring. According to Caradori, he had photographic evidence that would blow the case out of the murky water. After meeting with his source, though, Caradori's private plane exploded in the air. He was with his 10-year-old son at the time. Both died in the crash. According to Noreen, Johnny contacted her in 97 when he was 27 and told her the whole story of how he was kidnapped, tortured, brainwashed, hooked on drugs, and sold into the child sex trade. He pleaded with her not to say anything, promising her it would be the last thing either one of them did. According to Johnny, there was no escaping. From johnnygosh.com, quote, The people who take these children also do a thorough job of brainwashing, telling these young children that if they try to resume any kind of life with their families, they will be killed. It is enough of a threat that they do not try to contact their families, end quote. Amazingly, a few years ago, it was thought that a man who went by the name of Jeff Gannon was Johnny Gosh. Gannon suddenly appeared, of all places, in the press court of the White House during the Bush-Cheney administration. At first, nobody noticed him much. That is, until he started asking obvious softball questions meant for Bush to knock out of the park. Suspicious of the newcomer, the rest of the press corps did a little research on him. They quickly found that Jeff Gannon also went by the name James Guckert in the past and was also currently a high-paid male escort that went by the name of Bulldog. Retired agent Ted Gunderson, who intensely worked in the Johnny Gosh case until the day he died in 2011, was convinced that Gannon was Gosh. Gunderson says, my source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Go Johnny Gosh. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. The only way I'd be 100% sure is if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. So from Rents.com, August 18, 2000. Five, Noreen Gosh speaks about Jeff Gannon, Johnny Gosh, and the attempted theft of her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, by Charlene Fassa. So, in this article here, they talk about Noreen being threatened by this guy 
trying to steal her remaining book inventory and the reprint rights to her book. This is unconscionable. Noreen's book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, represents a huge part of her life story, and frankly, it's practically all she tangibly has left of her son. And that brings us to the Jeff Gannon conundrum. In addition to the potentially devastating legal battle of her book, Noreen is still trying to determine if Jeff Gannon is indeed her son, Johnny Gosh. Those who say there's not enough credible evidence to demand a DNA test, which would finally resolve the issue, are simply wrong. For example, Jim Rothstein, a retired New York City detective who spent 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery and pedophile rings, asserts that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, Rothstein opines. Everything just fits. The profile, the MO, everything. Then there's Ted Gonderson. Uh, well, also, just another point there, if Gannon is not Gosh, he could be another boy who was kidnapped and sold into child slavery, etc., and then that led to his path into being a child escort and his Bush connections and all that. Then there's Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has worked on the Johnny Gosh case for over a decade. On Gunderson's website, his bio reads, prior to retirement in 1979, Ted Gunderson had over 700 persons under his command and operated a $22 million annual budget. His complete resume is at tedgunderson.com. Gunderson says he has a credible source that is certain Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh. Gunderson reveals, let's just say he's in a position to know. The kids are all in touch with each other. It's a bond they all share. Gunderson concludes with, the only way I'd be 100% sure is if there is a DNA test or if he admitted it, end quote. Noreen confirms, quote, Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source. And the source said, Gannon is Gosh. And he said it. Without hesitation, and without blinking an, uh, an eye, and he said he's known it for months. Noreen believes the man is credible. Gunderson makes it clear that Bonacci is not his informant, but is quick to add that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. I mean, what does that mean, getting a, you know shaving his head or something? In fact, there's even corroboration from John DeCamp who weighs in with, quote, Bonacci told me the same thing, that Jeff Gannon is Johnny Gosh. Wow. Okay, so there's a lot of people saying, because there's people saying that Bonacci says that he didn't say that or whatever, but if he did say it to DeCamp and then denied it to others, is that just a way to protect himself, even if he really did say it? Because a lot of coincidence theories, they don't consider that possibility. But continuing on here... Uh, this bombshell from Noreen, the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. So he has more than one mark on his body in the exact same spot. Rostin, Gunderson, and Noreen Gosh are from the article... By Tim Schmidt, Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Hunter Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Okay, I'm going to read this article as well. It's, yeah, there there's some crazy, crazy little tidbits here. This is April 6, 2005, by Tim Schmidt. Johnny Gosh, Jeff Gannon, Hunter Thompson, and the Unraveling of a Troubling Tale. Cover story, Death of a Conspiracy. Noreen Gosh sits in a booth at the West Des Moines Village Inn, nursing a cup of coffee and managing, despite her larger-than-life personality, to blend into the surroundings and keep a low profile in the almost empty restaurant. She is open with her thoughts and willing to share what information she can, yet she remains guarded, cautious and thoughtful in a manner often mistaken as cold and standoffish. She thinks carefully as she speaks about her son Johnny and the players in a bizarre conspiracy surrounding his appearance in 1982 that continues to evolve and may finally be on the verge of breaking down. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, says Noreen slowly, that doesn't mean it's not true. It's a statement that bears repeating. Just because you don't want to believe something is true, that doesn't mean it's not true. 
Anyone who has heard the theories surrounding Johnny Gosh's disappearance on September 5th, 1982, and who in Iowa has not, knows they are difficult to accept. If there are satanic pedophiles working in the top levels of government and law enforcement, selling kids on the black market and forcing them into prostitution, pornography, extortion rings, and things far worse, it's easier as a human being to simply believe that such things could not be true. But they could be, and Noreen knows this all too well. She doesn't want to believe her child was kidnapped, sexually abused, tortured, brainwashed, and sold into slavery, but she accepts this now as an indisputable truth, and she is not alone. Many others accept the existence of a vast network of high-profile people, powerful politicians, business leaders, law enforcement, and government agents who exist in a subculture of degenerates who participate in child pornography, snuff films, drugs, devil worship, brainwashing, and kidnapping. And Noreen believes that Johnny and hundreds of other children like him were forced into this life of depravity by those who kidnapped him. But Johnny's story has been told thousands of times. It's been analyzed, disputed, and ridiculed just as frequently, and we neither have the time and space nor the inclination to repeat it in here in full. As tragic as it may be, it's old news. Nothing major has happened in the case for some time, and the alleged players in the story have been silent, absent, or simply missing for years. Until recently. In the past few months, there's been a flurry of activity among the people once related to this case and the conspiracy that surrounded it. In the midst of this commotion, some believe Johnny Gosh has been found very much alive. Recent events began with Jeff Gannon, the right-wing journalist who was found to have gained access to the White House press pool with few credentials and a fake name. The death of Hunter S. Thompson followed shortly after. The arrest of two men seemingly unrelated in Nebraska and Virginia within days of the Gannon story and Thompson's death also played a role in the story. And all these events, some suggest, are related to the 12-year-old paperboy kidnapped from West Des Moines 23 years ago. And if they are right, there is much more to come. Johnny lives. In late January, a conservative journalist in Washington, D.C. was found to have gained access to the White House press pool despite using a fake name and despite the fact that he once worked as a high-priced homosexual escort. Jeff Gannon was a White House correspondent for Talent News who regularly attended White House press briefings and had at least four press conferences with President George W. Bush. On January 26, 2005, Gannon asked a question of the president that was so friendly and factually inaccurate that some of his colleagues began looking into his background. And, and just a quick aside here again, and that's a very astute observation in the previous blog that we read that did Gannon do that on purpose to draw attention to himself so people would figure out he was Johnny Gosh while denying it in order not to put himself or Noreen Gosh in danger while, at the, while simultaneously exposing it to the world, hiding in plain sight, as his article was titled, previous to him asking that question. Talon News, it was learned, is a barely disguised tool of the Republican Party, and Gannon's credentials as a journalist consist solely of a training course at a leadership broadcast school of journalism. After two days of training that cost $50, <laughs> Gannon was officially a graduate of a journalism school and on his way to the White House press pool. I mean, that is kind of laughable. It was soon discovered that Gannon's real name is Jeff Guckert and that he has also gone by the nickname Bulldog when listing himself on the internet as a homosexual escort and personal trainer, charging $200 per hour for his discreet services. Gannon was removed from the White House and resigned from Talon News on February 8th. Gannon Gate quickly became the presidential scandal of the hour, though the story faded from public view as politicians and the media eagerly turned their attention to such pressing matters as steroids in baseball and the Terry Schiavo situation. But before long, internet bloggers had picked up the story and began to think back to the administration of President Bush's father which was rocked by a scandal that allegedly involved a high-level official giving private late-night tours of the White House to teenage male prostitutes. The New York Times and the Washington Post both wrote about the story and the eventual death of Washington lobbyist Craig Spence, who reportedly arranged the visits. Spence, it has been suggested, was preparing to admit publicly that he was using the teenage boys to blackmail high-powered politicians in the Beltway. He committed suicide before he had the opportunity to do so. Shades of Jeffrey Epstein, anybody? Anybody? Jill Zane Maxwell, anybody? Anybody? With a gay escort gaining access to the White House during a Bush administration while many of the same officials from the 80s are back in power, the question became, is there a connection? Private investigator Sherman H. Skolnick posted a story about the Gannon debacle on Rents.com, a site known for its conspiracy theories, and publicly stated on February 19th that Gannon is 
Johnny Gosh. Andy Stevenson, a blogger from Seattle familiar with the case of the, uh, the details of the Johnny Gosh case and the child sex rings in Nebraska, detailed in the book The Franklin Cover-Up, began with a group of other writers and investigators to ponder the claim. They looked at markings on Gannon's body and compared them to those reported on Johnny Gosh. They considered the lack of personal information about Gannon's early years. They considered that Johnny was alleged to have been used as a gay prostitute for blackmail purposes. They considered that the high-powered people alleged to have kidnapped and brainwashed children as part of the government's Monarch Project and the MK Ultra program included Johnny, did so to use them in a variety of ways to advance their own agendas. And they contacted Noreen Gosh and discussed the idea with her, the first she'd heard of the theory, and they too came to the conclusion that Jeff Gannon is none other than Johnny Gosh. The internet has been abuzz with the theory ever since, and in a way, it makes perfect sense. You've got a kid abducted and brainwashed into doing the bidding of government officials as part of a top-secret mind control program, so now that he's older, why not put him in the White House to soften press briefings to make the president look better? The suggestion for many is that Gannon is a monarch program child-turned-adult operative. Gannon, according to investigators like Skolnick, is involved in high-profile high-level espionage, and is also an expert on torture. He is said to have been an expert penetration agent using sex to compile negative data on U.S. and foreign government officials, and is also believed responsible for the Valerie Plame White House leak that allegedly caused 70 CIA undercover agents to be murdered. I mean, wow. I mean, what a tangled web this is. Yet others suggest that Gosh took on the persona of James Gannon, Jeff Guckard, and gained White House access with the eventual goal of exposing the people who kidnapped him and put him and his family through hell. Gannon is alleged to have a publishing deal with a Russian imprint, which some believe will result in a tell-all book that exposes those who've paid for his services, as well as the pedophile ring that he, as Gosh, was victimized by after his kidnapping. I'm convinced 99% that he is Johnny Gosh, says Ted Gunderson, a retired FBI agent who has been working on the Gosh case for more than a decade. The only way I'd be 100% sure if there was a DNA test or if he admitted it. He bases his opinion on a confidential source from whom he claims to have a videotape testimony that has him identifying Gannon as Gosh. My source has told me in the past that he has maintained contact with Johnny Gosh, says Gunderson. Let's just say he's in a position to know the kids are all in touch with each other and it's a bond they all share. Again, like, what does it take to fool former FBI head Ted Gunderson with experience in all of these trafficking and missing children's cases, satanic expose? I mean, th this guy clearly has a lot of experience in this dark world. And just as an investigator. The kids he refers to are those forced into the sex slavery rings in the government-sponsored mind and behavioral control programs. One of those kids is a man named Paul Bonacci, who claims to have participated in the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh and says he was forced to be the first person to molest Johnny. Bonacci has long claimed to be part of the vast network of children trained to work for the government and participate in deviant sexual acts to make the blackmail of politicians possible. In 1999, Bonacci won a $1 million lawsuit against Larry King, the former head of the Franklin Credit Union in Nebraska, whom he claimed forced him into the pedophile ring. The federal judge ruled Bonacci was truthful in his testimony, which included that he was one of several young male prostitutes known to have toured the White House in the 1980s. Gunderson claims that Bonacci is not his source for the Gannon is Gosh claim, but adds that Bonacci informed him a while back that Gosh had changed his appearance. John DeCamp, author of the Franklin cover-up, says Bonacci told him the same thing. Yeah, we have multiple people corroborating this testimony here. I do know that Johnny Gosh altered his appearance and the changes I've heard about conform to how Gannon looks now, he says. Paul told me you could be standing right next to him and not know it's Johnny. But here's the thing, though. Gannon does look exactly like Johnny, though. And he says that Gannon has been asked the questions but refuses to answer one way or another. A fellow in New York City went to his door and asked him about his mother in Iowa. And he, wait, 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 wait. Wait, what? Gannon's mother's from Iowa? Or she's not, and the reporter just phrased it that way, as if it's Noreen Gosh. A fellow in New York City went to his door, asked him about his mother in Iowa, and he slammed the door on him. He says he wouldn't talk about it at all. A mother's instinct. Noreen Gosh has seen the videotape that Gunderson made with his confidential informant and believes the man is credible. 
Ted sent me a videotape of his interview with his source, and he said Gannon is gosh. And he said it without hesitation, without blinking an eye, recalls Maureen, and he's, he said he's known it for months. When the theory was first proposed, Noreen's phone was ringing every 15 minutes from calls from bloggers, investigators, and radio and TV stations, all asking if she would identify Gannon as her son. She has not done so. She sat with numerous photos from the internet and compared them to those of Johnny herself and John Gosh Sr. looking for similar features. I could see some of the similarities that the bloggers were talking about, she says. I could see in Gannon the features that Johnny had. And the last time I saw Pablo Nachi, he told me that Johnny had changed his entire appearance again. That he shaved his head and is going with that look for now. Okay, so apparently Bonacci told, so Bonacci told Noreen before Gannon Gate that he had shaved his head and went with a different look. And this is corroborated by multiple other people, like DeCamp and Gunderson. So before Jeff Gannon was even a thing, Paul Bonacci said he went with, he, he shaved his head and he has a different look. I mean, that's curious. Again, that doesn't prove it's Gannon, but it's curious. She says the birthmark on Johnny's chest is very similar to a mark seen on Gannon's chest in at least one photo. She also points that Gannon has a spot on his right cheek in the same place as Johnny. Sometimes she's almost convinced, but it's, it's not quite enough, and she just can't or won't say for sure that Gannon is her son. People have asked me why can't I recognize him if I saw him in 97. And I tell them a picture from the internet is a lot different than someone sitting in your kitchen, she says. Noreen claims that Johnny visited her at his West Des Moines apartment in 97, but told her he could not come out of hiding because his life and hers would be put in grave danger. But what about her gut feeling, her maternal instinct? Honestly, it changes, she says. Sometimes I think, oh yeah, that looks like him, and other times the jump is too much to think about it. When you factor in the facts, it's hard to believe. I've spent a lot of sleepless nights over this. I really wish I could say for sure. So here's the thing. Those claiming Noreen is just out for attention or whatever, she seems to be honest about everything. I mean, just dissecting all her statements. Again, in the previous episode, we went over a lot of them. So, I mean, it seems like she's honest. And is the reason why her maternal instinct is changing is because of the split personalities and all of the mind control. I mean, again, I don't know how that would factor into instinct, but if she's seeing this Gannon guy and, and he's so different from her actual son, but then maybe other times he's not or there's flickers, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is all very, very mind shocking. But Noreen is no fool. She knows the risk of saying one way or the other if she thinks this is her son. If it is, and he's chosen not to say anything, she understands that he has his reasons for his secrecy and that are likely life-threatening and her outing him could very well put him at risk. If she were to claim Gannon is Johnny and it is proven wrong later, then any amount of credibility she has left would go out the window. Even if he, Gannon, admitted to it, I would still want a DNA test done, she says. This is so surreal, it's like I'm on the outside looking in. Almost 23 years have passed and we know he's still alive, but to potentially have your loved one found is just unreal. If this would turn out to be Johnny, it would be a blessing for everyone to know what happened and have it all wrapped up. Subliminal Hints that is unlikely to happen anytime soon. Despite millions of words devoted to the subject on the web and investigations being conducted by hundreds of internet detectives, Gannon has not acknowledged the speculation. Despite this, some say that Gannon has been providing clues to his real identity on his webpage, jeffgannon.com, which is still active. Uh, no longer, but at the time. Shortly after the theory was presented, Gannon posted an article titled Hiding in Plain Sight. Wait, wait, wait. He posted it after the theory was presented? Huh. And posted a column entitled Fear and Loathing in the Press Room, which some suggest is a reference to the recently deceased Hunter S. Thompson, who also was accused of involvement in pedophile child slavery in the 1980s. Wow. Oh, man. And the connection to Bonacci's claim about the snuff film at Bohemian Grove. I mean, this is a lot of coincidences here. I mean, it's a lot. Others suggest that his name itself is a clue to his real identity. Both Jeff Gannon and James Guckert share the same initials as Johnny Gosh. Furthermore, shortly after Johnny's disappearance, Noreen made a personal plea to the editor of the Des Moines Register, Johnny's employer. The editor printed her letter in the paper and mocked it, 
by allowing the police department to dissect it. The editor's name was James Gannon. Is this all too mind-shocking for people? I would say those are subliminal messages, says Gunderson, an attempt on Gannon's part to let slip his identity. Jim Rothstein, a retired New York police detective who spent more than 35 years on the force, much of it investigating child slavery pedophile rings, agrees that the evidence is strong that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh. To me, Gannon looks like Johnny, says Rothstein. Everything just fits. The profile, the MO, everything. Rothstein has been involved as a private investigator on the Gosh case for the past several years, and he is working to get the final proof needed to determine Gannon's true identity. We're working on getting a tail on him and getting a DNA sample to test, he says. I still can't figure out why no one knows where he, Gannon, was for 10 years. Why would he announce that, like, in an article, that they're going to tail him and get a DNA test? Although, I mean, you know, I mean, how hard can that be to do? There have been some internet postings that gave a timeline of Gannon's life, but according to Rothstein, they are based on flimsy information that is not to be trusted. Records are easy to create. Maybe this guckered kid died and someone took over his identity. If it is not Johnny Gosh, then it is one of the other kids like Johnny Gosh. Noreen says, if this is all true, I don't think he was ready to be exposed just yet. Hunter and Snuff Films. The Gannon-Gosh connection was first made public in the early morning, February 20th. Later the same day, Hunter S. Thompson was found dead in his home, the victim of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Few people would ever thought to connect Thompson and Gosh, but those familiar with the tales of child abuse and pedophilia documented in the Franklin Cover-Up, a book first released in 1994 by former Nebraska State Senator John DeCamp, understand the association. In his book, DeCamp relates many interviews and discussions with Paul Bonacci, the man who claims to have been involved with the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. Bonacci told horrific tales of being forced into sex with adults and other children. In one case, he recalls being flown into Nevada with another young boy whom he did not know. They took on another passenger there and headed to a secluded location where Bonacci says he was forced to have sex with a younger boy. The young boy, Bonacci claims in his book, was also forced to have sex with adult males, and then they killed the boy with a gunshot to the head. Bonacci says he was then forced to have sex with the corpse. The passenger they took on in Nevada filmed the entire thing, and Bonacci recalled that his name was Hunter Thompson. I think it's kind of strange that Hunter Thompson would commit suicide at this time, says Gunderson. Several kids told us that he directed snuff films. I think it's a strong possibility that he was murdered, and I strongly suspect that it's all connected. That's, in, that's an interesting statement from Ted Gunderson as well, because if other people have been blowing the whistle on Thompson for quite some time, you would think if he was going to commit suicide over the first instance, he would have, or the second or the third or whatever. But now, as soon as there's a gosh Gannon connection... Now he chooses to do it. I mean, it could be unrelated again, but it's just a coincidence here. And the speculation on the internet has been that Thompson was either killed to prevent his coming forward or that he killed himself because he feared his role as a director of child snuff films would be proven true. The camp also expressed some surprise at the timing of Thompson's death and says he still believes Bonacci's claim is true. Stevenson, the blogger from Seattle who has investigated the Gosh case, is also suspicious. I wonder, did he know? In light of Paul Bonacci's testimony regarding the snuff film, I submit he knew quite a bit, he says. The timing of his death was interesting. The snuff film that Thompson allegedly made with Paul Bonacci is believed, based on Bonacci's description of the surroundings, to have been filmed at Bohemian Grove, a summer camp of sorts for the rich and powerful. Bohemian Grove is a secluded area outside Sacramento, California, IA, where world leaders and dignitaries meet annually for a retreat that involves neo-pagan activities, including mock human sacrifices, or allegedly mock, made before a large owl statue referred to as Moloch. While conducting the ritual, which they call the cremation of care, participants are dressed in druid robes and chant and sing before Moloch. Information on these gatherings has been known for some time, although video footage has only been leaked out of the site, only recently been leaked out of the site. The site is very secure and access available only to a handful of people worldwide. As a child, Bonacci could never have had access to the site, but he described it accurately, including the large owl statue. I mean, that is so damning. All right, here's another mind shock. Noreen Gosh says that on one recent evening, 
her website, johnnygosh.com, had more than 50 hits that came from within a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So keep in mind, Sacramento is over 100 miles from, Bo- from Bohemian Grove. San Francisco is 75 miles. And Santa Rosa is over 20 miles. That might be the... That might be the, the biggest city, I think. Someone local to that area of Bohemian Grove can chime in here. But So there don't appear to be any big cities. So this is pretty much the middle of nowhere retreat or with just small towns or cities, really small, within a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove. So these are not people from major cities looking up johnnygosh.com. These are more than 50 hits from a 10-mile radius of Bohemian Grove out in the woods. What does that mean? I don't know. What do all the coincidence theorists think about that? The CIA pedophile. In her book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, Noreen Gosh writes about a man who contacted her just six months after Johnny's disappearance, claiming he worked with a government agency that was investigating pedophile organizations. George Paul Bishop, often known as just Paul Bishop, claimed he was a CIA asset and arrived in Des Moines in July 84 to offer his assistance to the Goshes. Before he left, he provided, through his investigation, a detailed map of the kidnapping scene. Bishop, according to Noreen's book, often called the Gosh home from the Washington, D.C. office of Senator Charles Grassley, with whom Noreen had worked on Johnny's case. Many times, Paul Bishop would call me from Senator Grassley's office, and when he finished speaking with me, he would hand the phone to one of Grassley's aides, who I was familiar with. Noreen recalled in her book, published in 2000, that convinced me Paul was an accepted visitor on the Hill in Washington. Based on this, Noreen believed that Bishop was responsible for securing her invitation to testify before Senator Arlen Specter's hearing on organized crime and its relationship to kidnapping at the U.S. Capitol. Bishop, in fact, picked Noreen up from her D.C. hotel and accompanied her to the hearings. Bishop became close to Noreen, even referring to her as mom. What? But suddenly, in 1985, he disappeared from the scene. The phone number he'd left was no longer valid, and no one knew how to contact him. No one had seen or heard from him in almost 20 years until he was suddenly arrested on February 4th of this year in Virginia after police allegedly found an explicit video of a 16-year-old boy in his home. Detectives searched Bishop's home and found the tape after receiving a complaint that he was allowing teenage boys to drink and use drugs on the premises. Noreen wonders now, if Bishop was on the wrong side of Johnny's case all along. Was he involved in the kidnapping and merely running a smokescreen at the time to prevent discovery? Was his recent arrest and effort to keep him quiet about the larger story a threat? So this is all from the unfolding of of, of Gannon possibly being gosh. This is weird. Or was he honest from the beginning and his, arre- his recent arrest merely an effort to discredit him before he reappeared and started making noise and threatening to expose the powerful people involved? Either way, Bishop seemed to know a lot about Johnny's disappearance in 1982 and his sudden appearance on the scene coinciding with the outing of Jeff Gannon and the death of Thompson and the arrest of another man involved with the case below is too much of a coincidence for some to accept. It's very common to set someone up and arrest him to discredit him, says Rothstein. The photographer. Okay, so here's going to be the Paul Bishop aside, because we touched upon him in the first one or two episodes, and some believe he was working for the CIA. Very, very shady. So let's go a little deeper into George Paul Bishop here. This is from johnnygoshtruth.blogspot.com, January 4, 2009, uncovering the Johnny Gosh case. Meet George Paul Bishop, a convicted and currently incarcerated 49-year-old pedophile in Fairfax Adult Detention Center located in Virginia. Arrested on August 19, 2005 for child pornography, he was due for release in March 2008, but was apparently incarcerated again for not registering as a sex offender. He is listed as violent. Most people know him as Paul Bishop, a profound figure central to the early investigation into the disappearance of Johnny Gosh. Noreen Gosh says within six months of Johnny's disappearance, September 5th, 1982, a young man named Paul Bishop had contacted her, arrived in Des Moines, Iowa, and claimed he was a CIA asset 
reachable via a phone number connected to Langley Air Force Base. And how often in missing persons cases does a CIA asset with a Langley Air Force Base phone number come to assist the family? Wow. Is he connected to uh, Aqu Michael Aquino, the, uh, the Air Force individual, who, the, the self-admitted Satanist? the open Satanist who was allegedly involved in human trafficking? And was this an attempt to keep close tabs on the investigation? Most notably, Paul had informed Noreen Gosh of an agency-acknowledged pedophile ring he claimed had kidnapped her son Johnny Gosh, and then drew her a detailed map supposedly outlining the planned kidnapping in question. According to Noreen Gosh, Paul Bishop was also the instrumental figure in securing her trip to Washington, D.C. for the purpose of testifying before Congress about her son's case for Senator Arlen Specter, as well as personally accompanying her with two unknown men to the U.S. Capitol building. Or is, was Paul Bishop the good guy here? And was he going rogue against these criminal elements of the government, against their knowledge, in order to expose all of this? And if so, was he framed for all of these crimes to discredit him? But anyway, continuing on here, after the disappearance of local newspaper boy Eugene Martin in 1984, Paul Bishop had informed Noreen Gosh that a local PI in contact with her, Sam Soda, was in the West Des Moines area and somehow involved with a kidnapping. So allegedly here, Paul Bishop is the one who first told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda it might be involved. Apparently, Sam Soda held a high distrust and suspicion of Paul, Bish from the, Paul Bishop from the beginning, and Noreen Gosh claims there's an audio tape brought to law enforcement. She claims they simply refuse to listen to it, of Sam Soda warning of an impending second kidnapping in Des Moines shortly before Eugene Martin disappeared. As a side note, there is exactly zero evidence of the existence of such a tape. I mean, is there? wasn't there one officer who said he listened to it? Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci, like after the fact or something. Since then, Noreen Gosh has claimed Paul Bonacci positively identified Sam Soda as being involved in photographing Johnny Gosh shortly before his kidnapping. And again, was that a man and a woman who were both photographing him? After Paul Bishop had told Noreen Gosh that Sam Soda was involved in the disappearance of Eugene Martin, Noreen claims Sam was instrumental in subpoenaing Paul Bishop to testify to a federal grand jury hearing about his whereabouts and activities in Des Moines. This comes after Paul Bishop supposedly visits Sam Soda's office, where he is promptly kicked out. Okay, so this possible CIA asset with an Air Force, uh, Langley Air Force Base phone number, he went, he actually went to Sam Soda's office and Sam Soda kicked him out. And is Sam Soda, like what's Sam Soda connected to? Because if he's involved in this ring, I mean, who's the good guy here? Or are they both the bad guys? Noreen further claims that she had questioned Paul Bishop after he had taken a taxi to her home in West Des Moines, interrupted by Sam Soda's phone calls demanding to know where Bishop was. And then Noreen organizes Paul's overnight stay at a friend's residence. So Sam Soda is calling Noreen demanding to know where Paul Bishop is. And why is Sam Soda not afraid of this possible CIA asset? It's like he's trying to track him down. After he had supposedly traveled back to D.C. two days later, apparently under the false identity Robert Levesque, she had received two calls from him and has since never heard from him again. Lastly, she claims the phone number Paul Bishop had given her to Langley Air Force Base was no longer valid. So wait a second, it was valid initially? So what happened to George Paul Bishop since then? Okay, wait a second. So trying to dissect the timeline here. So Paul Bishop, highly involved, then Paul Bishop visits Sam Soda, apparently gets kicked out, then Sam Soda calls Noreen Gosh at home demanding to know where Bishop is. Then Bishop goes back to D.C. allegedly, calls Noreen Gosh two more times, then disappears forever. This is weird. Police arrest two on child porn charges by Matthew Perrone. A complaint about excessive comings and goings of teenage boys at a Chantilly house led this week to the arrest of two Fairfax County men for child pornography offenses, Richard Evans of Annandale and George Bishop of Chantilly, who's co who co-manage a literary website, were both arrested by Fairfax County Police on Friday, January 28th. 
Police started investigating Bishop 46 after they received a complaint that he was allegedly inviting teenage boys to come to his house to, to drink alcohol and to take illegal narcotics. On January 7th, Detective Peter Charles of the Fairfax County Police Department served Bishop with a search warrant at his home in Chantilly. According to the warrant, in their search, Charles and other officers seized computer hard drives, letters, pictures, and a videotape showing a young man posing nude while dressed in bondage gear. Police identified the young man in the video as a 16-year-old resident of Centerville. Bishop appeared in the video with another older man who was bald and a long, bushy white beard. After examining emails that refer to a man who looks a lot like Merlin, police identified Richard Wendell Evans, 66, as the second man in the video. When police searched Evans' home in Annandale, they found various sex toys, sex toys digital cameras, and a leather hat and vest. According to the search warrant f following his arrest, Bishop told officers that he and Evans were co-creators of the website DeweyWriter.com. Bishop was actually working on the website when police came to his house on January 7th. The search warrant described DeweyWriter.com as primarily a literary website with online books posted by authors with names like Dewey, Graham, Ryan Keith, Sterling, Grasshopper, and Carolina Shribbler. One of the books by Dewey is titled For the Love of Pete and bears a dedication in its middle chapters. The author writes, I'd like to dedicate this chapter to all the boys out there who were never allowed to be children when they were kids. May you find the child in you long before I found the child in me. What the heck? Was was Paul Bishop possibly a trafficked kid himself earlier? And he wanted to blow the whistle on this? So he was some kind of an asset by this criminal organization, possibly in the CIA. And then he wants to blow the whistle on all this because that was him. And that's why he was so... Uh, Connected to the Johnny Gosh case? As of February 1st, the website had more than 270,000 hits and featured links to several chat rooms. Both men were released the day of their arrest. Bishop, who was charged with six counts of possession of child pornography and two counts of manufacturing child pornography, was released on an $8,000 bond. Evans was charged with one count of manufacturing child pornography and was released on a $2,500 bond. This is from Times Community Newspapers 2007. Okay, so Bishop pleads guilty to producing and possessing by Bonnie Hobbs. Thursday, June 30th, 2005. After being indicted by the grand jury in May, a Chantilly man pled guilty as charged Monday morning in Fairfax County Circuit Court. He is George Paul Bishop, 46. Do you fully understand the nature of the charges against you today? Asked Judge Leslie Alden. Yes, Your Honor, replied Bishop. Are you entering your pleas of guilt because you are guilty of these charges? She asked again. He replied affirmatively. Hmm. So, okay, so if he's not guilty, would he just say he is because he knows they're going to kill him if he doesn't? Is that, I mean, is, is that what some people allege? Hmm. And Evans pled guilty as well. Okay, and there's just a bunch more articles here. So in this August 26, 2005 article... So Bishop sentenced Friday three years in prison. The parents of one of his victims testified against him. So this is mostly concerning the tape and video he made of a teenage boy in bondage gear. The parents testified whose son alerted the police to what was going on. Okay. So, okay, something weird's going on here. This is a troubling case, said Mooney. Look at the pre-sentencing investigation and what the defendant says about his account of what happened. He wants the court to believe the minor was dressed up as a male slave because he wanted to dress that way for Halloween. He says it was consensual, and he was just being a nice guy and providing the outfit and the environment. He denies giving minors drugs and alcohol and takes no responsibility for it, she continues. And he says making the tape was stupid and a simple mistake. He was 46 and he has prior criminal convictions. He'd be more believable if he didn't have them. Mooney revealed that in 88, Bishop had two felony convictions in California IA for oral cop copulation with a minor, plus an assault conviction in Fairfax County after he lifted a 12-year-old paper boy's shirt and kissed his stomach. What? A paper boy? So in eight, this is in 1988, in the 80s. What? This is really weird with Paul Bishop here. So if that's all true and all these previous offenses are true, that does not look good for Bishop. So here's a quote from, uh, from Bishop. Bishop Stood said he regretted the three charges 
and had, had pled guilty to them. Quote, I am not a predator or a pedophile, he said. I don't have a proclivity for 17-year-olds. When I had a problem 20 years ago, I resolved it. Then I don't feel I'm a threat to the community. So is he basically admitting his previous problem here while he was assisting in the Gosh case? What is going on here? What? I mean, this gets even worse. So P Paul Bishop was also arrested between September 84 and September 85 in Alexandria, Virginia, for having sex with a 12-year-old boy at an Oakwood ap apartment complex. Soon after, he fled to California, but returned to Virginia after charges were filed against him there before disappearing again up to his arrest and incarceration in 2005. So wait a second. So he's a possible CIA asset while a... Okay, so he this was before that. September 84, he was arrested? Between 80... When was he assisting with the Gosh case? Like, so this is really weird. So, again, from the blog here, let's summarize what's going on here. A longtime pedophile and child pornographer, George Paul Bishop, approaches Noreen Gosh shortly after her son's kidnapping to inform her he is a CIA asset. And how is he in this, co how is he in this uh, office in D.C.? Like, what the heck's going on here? And has information about an underground network of conspiracy that has kidnapped Johnny Gosh. According to Noreen, he, is supposed he supposedly can be contacted at a phone number traced to Langley and organized her testimony to a congressional hearing about her son's case in D.C. What is rarely mentioned was that George Paul Bishop was a child molester and admitted pedophile during all of this, associating with other pedophiles like Richard Evans, who had a record of aggravated sexual assault toward a minor in 1984, up to producing child pornography of his victims in 2005. What do the disturbing latter facts have to do with Noreen Gosh? Apparently, Noreen and her camp aren't shy at all about endorsing George Paul Bishop as a heroic whistleblower of sorts, a CIA asset which provided facts that they claim proved true in their ensuing private investigations into the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh. How did they answer George Paul Bishop's obvious record of child molestation, pedophilia, and child pornography charges since the 80s? They don't, or sometimes they claim it's some kind of CIA operation frame-up. All right, here's the thing, though. Let's say it's not a frame-up, because if Bishop is part of was also one of these kidnapped children. So he has all these mental issues, and he is guilty of all of this, of just repeating these cycles. Does that, and, and, and maybe possibly also has multiple personality dis disorders, like, like Bonacci does. Like, because Bonacci, again, guilty of all these things he said he was. I mean, is this, yeah, th this is actually kind of crazy, because is that the case, where he is a self-admittedly guilty of all these things due to what happened to him, and he's still trying to help and blow the whistle, similar to Bonacci? I mean, is that true? All right, so that's what we have on Bishop. Now, let's go back to the previous article. So Bishop, just the timeline here, regarded Gannon might be gosh, Thompson. Now we're moving on here to the photographer. Rusty Nelson claimed that he once turned down an offer of $50,000 from Hunter S. Thompson to help in the production of a snuff film. The offer was allegedly made because Nelson worked closely with Larry King, the central figure in the Franklin cover-up, accused of running a pedophile and child slavery ring. Nelson would often accompany King to elaborate parties where he worked as a photographer taking photos of high-profile individuals in compromising positions with young boys and girls. Nelson testified in court that he participated as a photographer, but claims that he took compromising photos. He never took any hardcore pornographic pictures, that he absolutely refused any involvement with child pornography. But he claims that King employed a Nelson lookalike for this purpose in order to compromise the powerful people in the photos and Nelson himself. What? Nelson has admitted taking tens of thousands of photos, many of which have been confiscated and either destroyed or permanently sealed to protect those depicted. But many, according to some reports, remain hidden. Despite his denials, Nelson has served time for his photography work, having been arrested in Oregon years ago with a van full of photos, at least one of which was said to involve a minor engaged in less than legal activity. He's been living in Nebraska for some time, providing what information he can to PIs and trying to put his life back together. More recently, he was working with a friend to open a studio that specializes in wedding photography. But two days after Thompson's death, Nelson was rounded up by police and arrested reportedly for failing to register as a sex offender in a county of which he was no longer a resident. 
John DeCamp bailed Nelson out of jail and says he thinks the arrest was intended as a warning to him and others that they best keep their mouths shut. Others agree. The timing is interesting, says Stevenson, especially given Thompson's death and Paul Bishop's recent arrest. I would place a suicide watch on both men. I think there's fixin' to be a heap of manure hitting the air circulating device soon, he said. I wonder about the timing. I've been wondering why all of these people have all of a sudden come out of the woodwork. I wonder if there is a purge going on. I don't think injustice ever leaves the public consciousness. I think there's far more going on here than we know. So why now, after all this time, why the activity and renewed interest in the Johnny Gosh case and tales of child abduction, slavery, and prostitution in general? Did the theory that Gannon is actually Johnny Gosh hit too close to home and threaten to expose those with secrets to keep? One suggestion is that increased media attention has the players in the decades-old scandal getting jumpy and looking to protect themselves. Nick Bryant, the man who confronted Gannon at his home and asked him about Johnny Gosh, has apparently been working on this story for several years and has been shopping the finished product around for a publisher. Rostian says he's been working with Bryant for at least three years and that Bryant was originally commissioned to do the story for Rolling Stone, which has since turned the finish piece down. The New York Times and several other outlets have reportedly shown interest in the story recently as well. Bryant declined to comment either on the Gannon situation or his involvement in writing a story. But Rothstein says that Bryant began showing the piece around the players involved have once again become active. Something is cooking here now, he says. They'll have to throw someone to the wolves, but there's no telling how high it will go. Everyone involved in the story acknowledges that it sounds like a wacky conspiracy theory, but the evidence of the conspiracy is too vast, they say, to simply dismiss it. It's, I'm a conspiracy realist, because there is conspiracy out there, says Gunderson, who says just two weeks ago he was chased through his neighborhood by an unknown man with a gun? What? Adds Rothstein, if two people were involved in kidnapping that kid, then it's a conspiracy. Well, these people don't work alone, so it's a conspiracy. Then try to discredit you by calling you a conspiracy theorist. Damn right I'm a conspiracy theorist, because that's what it is. Still, in the end, this is a story about a young boy stolen from his home and family. This simple tragedy is often lost in the complicated theories and conjecture, but it remains the single undeniable truth in the entire story. I hold out hope that we'll be able to have regular communications with him, Noreen says of her son. We know he's alive, and up until a few years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. What? Nor Noreen said, we know he's alive, and up until a couple years ago, we knew what he was doing and where. Maybe he could keep in touch with his mom, but moving back to Des Moines to live a life here, those windows of opportunity have closed. I hear the horrible things people say about me. I can only imagine what they would say about him, given the things he's been through. Johnny knows I tried, and who's to say it's all over? We don't know yet. If this is it, we're in the final days, and this is going to all this is going to blow wide open. So that's curious. So Noreen said that up until a few years ago. So now keep in mind, this article is April 6, 2005. So she's stating up until a few years ago, she knew what he was doing and where. So apparently there was some kind of contact after the visit. Okay, let's take another step back. Now we're going to the Rents article, which referenced this article that we just went over. But continuing on here with Rents, the bottom line is this. There is enough credible evidence linking Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh for Noreen and her private investigators to insist on a DNA test. The credible evidence phase of this case has passed. It's now a case of obtaining conclusive evidence. To her credit, Noreen has always maintained that she didn't know beyond a shadow of a doubt if Gannon was or wasn't her son, Johnny. But she'd like to know. And I believe she deserves to know whichever way it turns out. So here's an interview with Noreen Gosh linked here, also on Rents.com. I mean, some more interesting details here, which are problematic. So Charlene Fossa, the author of the article I just went over on Rents, is interviewing her here. So she asks, Is, isn't this the first time Jeff Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Johnny Gosh? Why now? So Michael Corbin here on the Closer Look Denver-based radio talk show 
stated that uh, Gannon denied, officially denied that he's Gosh, and offered to Noreen Gosh to take a DNA test. Developments will follow. So this is the interview in the aftermath here. Charlene, okay, so isn't this the first time Gannon has publicly stated that he's not Gosh? Why now? Noreen responds, I think Gannon needs to continue the publicity and is now coming forward on the DNA only to keep somewhat of a spotlight on himself. Charlene responds, even though you've always publicly maintained that you didn't know if Gannon was Gosh, Gannon has threatened to sue you on three different occasions. Why? What types of contact have you had with Jeff Gannon? Noreen says, I have only had email communication with Gannon. He threatened to sue me because I have stated I do not know if Gannon is or is not Johnny. He claims that is throwing doubt into the minds of people who would otherwise say he is not Johnny. I would think he would want the DNA test, and if he is not Johnny, then state it publicly and be done with it. Charlene says, I understand there are some unique physical characteristics that Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh share. What are they? There are many facial features and the basic structure of his face, which are similar to Johnny. The color of his eyes and reports of a birthmark on Gannon is the same as Johnny's. I have not seen the birthmark, however. So that was at the time of the interview. And then supposedly after she did see it and she said it was in the same spot. Charlene says, for many internet researchers and bloggers, they appear to be numerous reasons to suspect that Gannon and Gosh are the same person. For starters, the name Jeff Gannon seems to be related to Johnny Gosh in a twisted sort of way. Would you explain the name game and how it relates to other players and Johnny? Noreen states, it appears all of the aliases names Gannon has used that he has kept the same initials as Johnny. J-D-G. Oh, wow. We didn't even look at that before. So Johnny got, it's John David Gosh. And he's James D. D G Guckert. What? So even the middle name has the same initial. Wow. So these games being played here, they're even worse than I thought. He's even got the same middle initial. Wow. Noreen continues here. Gannon also chose the last name of the Des Moines Register editor at the time Johnny was kidnapped. There just seems to be a replay constantly of Johnny's initials or clues that link Gannon to parts of Johnny's life. Charlene states, besides the physical attributions and JDG initials pattern, what other linkages, revelations between Gannon and Johnny may have compelled you and your team to propose a DNA test to be administered to Gannon in order to achieve closure on the Gannon-Gosh issue? Noreen states, there have been two informants who have stated Gannon and Johnny are one and the same person. For me, the only way that could possibly be resolved is a DNA test. That is the reason my investigative team have asked for a DNA test. Charlene states, I understand you've verified that Johnny had plastic surgery about four years ago. And coincidentally, he also started shaving his head around the same time. Noreen states, yes, long before Gannon surfaced, I had learned that Johnny had plastic surgery and bega begun to shave his head. So when Gannon did come on the scene, it was one more thing to consider. Charlene asks, not long ago in an internet radio interview, I heard Rusty Nelson, Larry King's ex-private pedophile ring photographer, speaking about, among other things, Jeff Gannon and Johnny Gosh. Unfortunately, Rusty Nelson's story is beyond the scope of this interview. Suffice to say, in order to survive and out of sheer desperation, Rusty managed to escape from Larry King's clutches and is currently on the lam. Naturally, having been King's private photographer, Nelson knew Johnny. During the interview, Nelson offered his opinion on whether or not he thought Johnny Gosh was Jeff Gannon. To paraphrase, he volunteered that he felt close to certain that they were one and the same person. He followed up with an anecdotal story about having ser serendip serendipitously bumped into Johnny Gosh several years at a farmer's market. I can't recall where. It seems to me that Rusty Nelson is qualified to speculate on the matter. Were you aware of his conjecture? Have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Okay, hold on a second here. Hold on a second here. So former FBI head Ted Gonderson believes 99% that Gannon is gosh. DeCamp believes Gannon is gosh. Bonacci supposedly stated Gannon is gosh. There's another confidential source who stated definitively that Gannon is gosh. And now Rusty Nelson is stating that he bumped into gosh years ago, several years ago to Farmer's Market, and is also stating that Gannon is gosh. 
I mean, that's a lot of people with direct connections to the case. Some of the people who directly knew Johnny before, and, well, I mean, all of them, if you believe, Rusty Nelson and Bonacci, but, and this other guy. I mean, this is crazy. This is a lot of directly connected people stating they believe that Gannon is gosh. Wow, what does everybody make of that? So, continuing on with the interview here, have you been in contact with Rusty Nelson? Noreen states, I have been in contact with Rusty and have known him for years. He has shared a great deal of information with us and testified in federal court in 1999 as to all of these events. He told me nearly four years ago that he had seen Johnny at the farmer's market in a particular city, so she did not reveal which one here. Wow. Wow. Charlene states, as of yet, as of late, you've been in contact with the Franklin kids. There are children from the Des Moines and Omaha area who were also abducted and MK altered into Larry King's international elite controlled pedophile ring around the same time Johnny was. Some of these survivors are no doubt members of the original 83 children who came forward to testify about their horrific abuse in the Franklin case. Of course, like Johnny, these children are now approaching 40 years of age, but they are most likely developmentally arrested to greater or lesser degrees emotionally frozen at the age they were abducted and ritually traumatized. Can you share with us what these survivors, the, victim of King, the victims of King's pedophile ring, are telling you of their horrific ordeal and their feelings about the future? Noreen states, I have been in touch with a number of the Franklin kids. Many have shared information with me. They continue communication to this day. For a number of them, their lives have been broken as children who are victims of these crimes. It is true they are now all approaching 40 years of age. Many are fed up, angry about what happened to them and how their lives have been robbed. Some want to do something about it, and others are still very afraid for themselves and their loved ones. Charlene says, I believe that you said some of these survivors feel like they've been programmed to do something in the future, but they don't know what it is. It sounds like a group of sleeper Manchurian candidate cells that could be activated at any time for evil purposes, no doubt. Could you explain? Well, I mean, that's just when you think this case can't get any creepier. I mean, what the heck? Noreen states, it is a form of Manchurian candidate. Many feel those kids are programmed to be accessed or triggered for some future use or a project. Charlene states, many of these kids knew Johnny. Do some of the Franklin kids you've been in contact with believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny? Gosh, wow. Who, who's ready for the response here? Who's ready for this response? Noreen states here, the majority of the Franklin kids I have been in contact with do believe Jeff Gannon is Johnny. Some say they have been in communication with him on a fairly regular basis. I would suspect this is done by email and computer rather than face-to-face -face meetings. Okay. All right. So we have former FBI head Ted Gunderson investigator of many decades. He believes Gannon is gosh. We have this New York City detective who investigated child abductions and, and child trafficking and rings. He believes Gannon is gosh. DeCamp believes that Johnny gosh is now Gannon. Bonacci supposedly stated that Gannon is gosh. Rusty Nelson said that Gannon is gosh. And now Noreen is stating here the majority of the Franklin kids she's in contact with believe that Gannon is gosh. Wow.